Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, which we have called Just Transition into Cleaner Energy, organized by the National Agency for Research and Development of Chile, ANID, and Caldo Consortium. For the opening remarks, first, I would like to give the microphone to Mrs. Fabiola Cid, and its Human Capital Subdirector. Fabiola, please. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I, hope I have some words to you. Mr. Rodrigo Delgado, Caldo Consortium Executive Director, the Canadian and Chilean experts that we're presenting in a few minutes, their attendees. On behalf of the National Agency for Research and Development of Chile, and it, I want to welcome all of you to this important instance. I would like to celebrate the realization of this webinar, just transition into cleaner energy. First of all, because the relevance of the topic. The climate change is a reality that affects the whole world. So occasions like this are more important than ever. Today, we will have the opportunity to listen to the presentations and be part of the discussions between top Canadian and Chilean researchers in just transitions who will address the challenges that society have on this process. How we incorporate solar energy successfully and how we move on into a cleaner energy matrix. All of this working together with indigenous communities. In addition, in my position of subdirector of human capital of this agency, it's not to say that the, this webinar is a very symbolic and important event for us. The consortium has been one of the most important partners for us in our scholarship funding since the signature of our first agreement seven years ago and the recently renewal of this. Caldo is the only university's consortium on which we have assigned an agreement and of course, with such prestigious and select group of institutions. This webinar marks a milestone in this the relationship which we would like to strengthen and deepen. So we hope this is just the first event of many more to come. I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank everyone to be here today, especially the experts who prepared this position for this meeting, which I'm sure will fulfill everyone's expectations. Last but not least, I would to like to thank all the Caldo teams um, that has worked hard to make this webinar a success, especially to Rodrigo Delgado, who has been a great friend of Anid and a true ally to make this webinar reality. Thank you very much to all, of, and come on, let's go to the webinar. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fabiola. Now, Mr. Rodrigo Delgado, Executive Director of Caldo Consortium, will address a few words. Rodrigo, please. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, buenos dias a todos. I am very pleased to be here this morning. Thank you, first of all, to uh, Ms. Uh, Fabiola Cid from ANIT, Mr. Jack Brady from ANIT, and all the ANIT teams. Thank you for being here, Ricardo Acevedo from the Communications Department, and thank you to every a professor from the Canadian universities that will be participating today. And the same thing to every Chilean professor and researchers that will be participating this morning in this webinar. At the same time, thank you to Gloria by Gorrotegui, uh, just uh, well pronounced, I expect, I, I, I hope so. And that is going to be the moderator this morning for the webinar. So thank you to everyone for being here this morning. Thank you for taking the time to participate in this event. As uh, Fabiola was mentioning, uh, Anid is one of our important, absolutely partners that we have in Latin America. Uh, Caldo is a consortium that it was uh, created uh, back in 2011 and since that time up to now, we have been working in Latin America and ANIT is a, one of our uh, oldest partners in the region. Uh, just a couple of months ago, indeed, we just signed the renewal of an agreement that we have for graduate mobility 
of Chilean students that could come to our universities to study masters and PhD programs. So we are very pleased to be here this morning. I hope that every one of you, it is uh, healthy and safe at your places, especially due to the current situation that we are experiencing uh, around the world. I am um, this morning, uh, and we were just talking uh, before we start to the, the, the conversation, the webinar, we were just talking about the weather here in Canada. We are at least in the place where I am right now and Heather in Toronto as well, and Greg in Saskatchewan. So we are in the middle of the winter in some of our cities is snowing at this point. I know that in Santiago it's 35 projected for today. So it is a little bit a different, uh, of course, temperatures in between the two places, but I am pretty sure that everything is going to be very interesting for everyone and we are going to be very close very far away in distance but very close this morning in everything that we are going to share through this webinar of just transition into cleaner energy uh, just i want to mention quickly that um, as uh, fabiola was uh, explaining before it is uh, our first webinar that we are organizing with anit it has been uh, an interesting challenge that we have been passing through in the last couple of months in order to increase uh, our, uh, our ties, uh, in order to increase our relationships with Anid and with the Chilean universities. And that's the reason why we are here this morning. And we hope, as Fabiola mentioned, that it is going to be just the first one of many other webinars that we could do in the upcoming months. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you for your presence. And just uh, as a final words, I want to just mention uh, in order to initiate the conversation, uh, I would like to provide you a little bit more background about what Caldo is and what Caldo uh, could do in order to facilitate the communications between researchers, professors from Latin America, from Chile in this case, and students interested in coming to our universities to study masters and PhD. So if you allow me, I'm gonna just share briefly a, a couple of slides just to show you a little bit of information about Caldo. Please, uh, Jack, if you can confirm if everything is fine, uh, if the image is... Yeah. Okay, we wonderful. can see it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. So, here is it. So, Caldo, as I was mentioning, is a consortium of top Canadian research universities uh, offering programs in English and French. As you know, Canada is a bilingual country, so we have universities offering programs in English, other in French, and at the same time, some of our universities could offer programs in both languages. Uh, Caldo, as, uh, as mentioned before, has been working with Latin American countries. And right now we have agreements in nine different countries in the region from Mexico to Chile. What are the universities of the consortium? Here they are. And this morning we will have the chance to share with professors from University of Alberta, uh, University of Toronto and University of Saskatchewan. Uh, but without a doubt, uh, all the Caldo universities that you see on the screen are top research institutions and they have very strong relationships with many Chilean universities, with Latin American universities. And one of the goals of this morning and this kind of event is to increase our partnerships, our relationships and connections between Caldo members universities and Chilean universities or, as I said, other universities in the region. Uh, the universities in Canada, and that's uh, something that, of course, is uh, similar to uh, in every country, are uh, distributed in different provinces, in different regions. And here in Canada, we have, as I said, uh, universities this morning that are coming from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, the University of Toronto here in Ontario, at the city of Toronto. So 
all the Caldo members universities are distributed uh, along the different provinces. And according to the geography of the provinces, every university has more concentration in terms of research in different topics. So that is something that is part of our uh, main um, topics that we work along with the government of Canada, with the provincial government, with local companies, and of course with international partners. So just to finalize my brief introduction, so I just want to mention that Caldo is a, is a tool to facilitate communication and relationships between government, institutions, universities from Latin America with Caldo members universities in Canada. We are a simple single point of contact for discussion of mobility, collaboration. We support connections and matchmaking between institutions, as I said, departments and researchers. And of course, we sign agreements with top uh, agencies from the region. And at the same time, and especially probably this morning, there are some potential students or candidates interested in coming to study a research master or a PhD program to our universities in Canada. Caldo could be at the same time uh, a good uh, tool in order to facilitate how to connect with our universities and support the communication between candidates and the programs at Caldo members universities. So our goal is to support this relationship and allow more Latin American Chilean students that could come to our universities to study different programs. All our information, uh, it is going to be available on our website. So more than happy to be here and if you feel uh, connected with what we were just saying and you want to share some information, you are interested in exploring some opportunities with some of our universities, more than happy to uh, connect with you. And please, on the screen, you can see the different channels through uh, where you can make the communication happen. So. Thank you so much again. Thank you to every professor. Thank you to every researcher participating this morning. And thank you to Anit and all of you on your offices or maybe your homes uh, or universities or et cetera. So that are participating this morning and I wish to every one of you a very successful webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Uh, this webinar will be divided uh, into three blocks. The first block it's called Canada and Chile Comparative Just Transition Strategies. The second block has been named a Just Transition into Solar Energy. And the third block is Just Transition Management and Indigenous Communities. Mrs. Gloria Baigorrotegui will be moderating these uh, three blocks. Uh, Mrs. Baigorrategui is an industrial engineer from Universidad de Santiago, where she is currently a professor. She is also a PhD in social studies of science and technology from University of Basque Country in Spain. Uh, Gloria's research uh, work has been mainly focused on science, technology, and society, especially in an energetic uh, technologies and the link between social movements and science and technology. Um, so, Gloria, the stage is all yours. I hope I, 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 I of course, I couldn't mention all your resume uh, complete, but I just wanted to highlight a few, a few important uh, issues. So, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much for the consortium and the ANIT teams to invite me in this interesting webinar, the first webinar. Um, yes, this, this is my interest in energy, society, social movements, and how the technical uh, knowledge is engaged in different social and community aspects. Well, uh, my role is to moderate. I try to maintain the the fluence of the conversation, but we need to uh, connect with some times 
15 minutes around around 15 minutes is the time and uh, Hector Chavez is the first presenta presentator <laughs> presenter of this meeting and we uh, yeah only uh, we have this uh, situation that he had to move uh, in I don't know 20 minutes or <laughs> maybe it's super fast presentation. And then we have uh, the presentation of Heather McLean. Huh? This is the, the name. Yeah, first I want to present Hector and then Heather, and we move on on the next stage. No? Hector is Bachelor of Science and Engineering from my university in San Santiago de Chile, and as a PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering in Texas. Uh, Austin in the United States and postdoctoral fellow of Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Then to move from South America, North America, and Europe. No? He's director of the Sustainable Energy Integration Laboratory at, the un at this university, and his research focused on the opera operational and economic impact of the integration of sustainable sources into traditional energy systems. Hector. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Gloria. I'm very happy to be here that you have me here. So I will share the, the screen to go directly to, to the presentation. And uh, I'll be talking about this just transition in the case of Chile, very brief. Uh, I'll be uh, touching like two main things, one in like the large scale power system and then into more uh, uh, sort of community type of, of transitions. So this is Chile. Uh, some people believe that Chile is part of a, of, of a Mexican province in the, in the south. It's the very south of, of Mexico, I would say. It's at the very end of, of South America. And it's this long country here. And uh, in terms of renewables, uh, it's been changing. It's a transition that is happening in Chile. And we see like uh, this year we're expecting 20% of renewables overall in the grid. The energy, the electrical energy will be 20% provided by renewable energies, not considering large, uh, large scale hydro, just mini hydro. So round or river hydro, as we said. And in terms of uh, capacity, we're about the same, like 20% of, uh, of our electric uh, generating capacity is provided by renewable energy. And uh, our goal was, uh, I mean, was 20% uh, by 2025. So we're sort of uh, moving into this transition very fast. So it's something very important uh, in our country. And uh, the results have been successful mainly because of solar, which is going to be the, the, the next block. So I will move to uh, the just transition concept. So we all know that a uh, very important problem happened in, in, in France, right? The red jacket, the yellow jacket, sorry. And uh, th there was this intention from the government to take, uh, to, to impose some taxes on, on, on oil, right? And those taxes were supposed to be in favor of renewable energy policies. But then people, uh, even though this thing was sort of uh, a good thing in, in, in a common sense perspective, uh, that was not fair. That was not just in the in, in in the concept of people because they have to pay, you know, more for the oil, and that was not fair in their terms. So the just transition comes from the fact that the policies has to be fair for everyone in terms of someone will pay something for this transition, and that payment to society has to be uh, distributed somehow in a fair con in a just manner. So in Chile, we have something like that just happening because uh, Chile policy, it's being uh, very aggressive uh, in terms of uh, shutting down coal uh, generating power plants. That is good. We're expecting by 2014 that every single uh, coal power, uh, uh, power system, power station will be shut down by 2014. And the side effect is, of course, that a lot of people work on those industries, let's say 4,400 jobs will be directly affected and almost uh, 10,000 will be indirectly affected. So for the size of the population of Chile and those regions where this, this uh, power systems are, 
uh, this is very significant. So the question is, how are we going to deal with this? And this is sort of the large scale questions we have right now. What is the transition that makes this possible not affecting this amount of people? So that, that's a very uh, so, sort of burning question right now. The government, it's being uh, changing the policies. The, the, the agreement we, we actually we actually took in, in, in the Paris Agreement. And there is this uh, determining contributions, uh, which are like the, 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 the very actions we, we, we are trying, the, the strategies we have to, to fulfill this agreement. So by 2021, there is this promise, this a compromise that there's going to be a strategy for a just transition, right? This strategy for just transition is on the table. They're under discussion, they're round tables and, and they're just trying to, to, to take a look at what we're going to do. It's just like that. We're not yet having a, a, a solid policy on that. And uh, the underlying truth in Chile is that this uh, uh, technological changes has been very difficult in the past. We have nitrate drains, what we call, I call nitrate drains, but uh, at the very beginning of last century, we have a very uh, successful industry on extracting nitrates for the war, the World War I and, and, and things like that. The Germans invented the, the synthetic nitrate and the industry just collapsed and no one saw that like coming. Then we have the same thing with the copper. Same thing with the copper. We're trying to just move into a more modern uh, industry not successful. And it seems that the lithium we have the same uh, sort of uh, future. So Chile is not a country that is uh, used to change, technologically speaking, the, the industry in, 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 a, in a fast manner. So I think it's a problem. Then we have the transitions for small systems, because Chile, it's the power system, let's say the, the, the electric grid, is this part of Chile. The rest of Chile is not connected to the, the, the mainland. And this part of Chile is not very populated. And if you want to have electricity, you have to deal with your own technology, like local uh, uh, developments, microgrids, and things like that. And this is an example that Gloria is very uh, familiar with. She is actually working on a project here. And I'm just mentioning this as an example. Uh, on the south of Chile, you see the, very, the sort of the, the middle of on the south, you see this, this white here, it's, it, it's a glacier, a big one. And we have this place called uh, Puerto Eden. And Puerto Eden, it's a place that has to get some er electrical energy somehow. And currently, uh, they have trying to, to, to take advantage of the hydro resources. And the problem is that people get there and install things and they get out of the, the region and then some one has to uh, maintain them. The community has to maintain them. And as the communities are concerned about other things like uh, fishing, like maintaining their self uh, in, in, in a good shape as a community, they do not have the knowledge to repair these things or, or, or have a, a, a good maintenance plan. So that is a problem we have been uh, looking at. In the hazardous communities, like, like this type of communities, that, which are common in, in, in Canada as well, are very, uh, in, in, a, in a very difficult manner, trying to maintain all this technology. So people go there, install things, they take pictures like this, and they get out. What happens with the communities? They have to get involved into the technology in order to maintain them. So that is something we're uh, researching about is how to get communities involved in energy because if they do not get involved, they cannot survive in terms of energy because no one will get there like in a regular basis just to maintain things. They have to do that. They have to learn how to do that with their own knowledge. So just final remarks, the, uh, my opinion, we have like two problems in Chile. We have this large scale transition in terms of uh, moving to, uh, a cleaner electricity uh, grid and which uh, I mean that's sort of happening uh, in, 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 in like in, in the large scale scenario but we are having this problem with the jobs 
right? It's common. I, I've heard a lot of uh, research in Canada as well on, on, on how to uh, get these jobs back to, to someone we can manage. But then we have the small scale problem in that, in, in the sense that we need to get communities involved in the technical aspects of the infrastructures they have. Because as far as our experience uh, tell us, they're not capable of maintaining them. So as I said before, people get there, install things, they get broken, no one uh, gets them back to, to function. So that was my, my uh, sort of take about this fair transition, this just transition to renewable energy. So I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the, of the second presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector. Yeah, we have many discussions about the engineer technical knowledge and the projections of the different system, energy systems and, and different remote places. This situation is very difficult to understand at the, at the first time, no? when all this system is constructed and then forget or alone or um, and all the things uh, bec become becomes uh, pressure or uh, waste or problem obsolete yeah. and then maybe my, my question oh, here Francisco Calderon make them uh, in uh, the example of Puerto then how much energy supply does electrical energy account for We, I think we, we should take the question at, at the end of, of, of Heather's presentation, just to... Yes, so you can continue. stay there here until the last presentation, the mm -hmm. next presentation. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, please. Super, that, yes. But the questions about Puerto then is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, bueno, Heather is professor and associate chair at Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering of University of Toronto, is bachelor in engineer in Dalhousie University, MBA at St. Mary University, and PhD at Carnegie Mellon University. Wow. In her primer, primary area of research involves developing and applying the life cycle assessment and technoeconomic methods. To evaluate, the tech, to evaluate the technical and externality impacts of conventional and alternative energy and transport systems and elements of the built environment more generally. And we have all the infrastructures and the impact assessment. Heather, thank you very much and go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Buenos dias a todos. Gracias por la oportunidad de presentar mis perspectivas sobre este tema tan importante. Thank you for this opportunity. So I would like to share my screen. Hopefully it will work as it did uh, yesterday. Can you see my screen? Yes? Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So just briefly, and I will try to keep this to 15 minutes, uh, I will just provide a little bit of uh, introduction to the just transition, talk about the role of the type of work I do on sustainable systems assessment, provide a bit of an introduction uh, to those of you less familiar with Canada's energy supply demand and greenhouse gas emissions, briefly go through a couple of uh, recent studies and then provide my closing thoughts. Uh, I took this from the Stockholm Environmental Institute's uh, Just Transition Principles, although the Just Transition has been along, around for much longer than since just 2020. But my work uh, primarily involves the idea of the decarbonization aspects and avoiding uh, the creation of carbon lock-in. So the, the work that we do looks at ensuring that when we move to alternatives, that these actually are lower carbon, but not just lower carbon, but also do not introduce unintended negative consequences on, on the environment or society. And due to the complexity of energy systems, uh, we sometimes do very high level screening analysis, but also sometimes get into very sophisticated analysis uh, to determine what would actually be net benefits 
and potentially unintended consequences, whether positive or negative. And so the work, as Gloria has kindly mentioned, uh, involves life cycle assessment, where we look at the supply chains, right from the resource extraction up through the production of a product or energy, and then its use. We also take into account the economics of it, technical feasibility, things like biofuels. We try to account for how much biomass would be there for supply. And then my work does not deal very well with societal impact. I usually collaborate with others who are more expert in, in these types of aspects. So Canada is very dependent. Uh, it's a very large country as uh, Rodrigo showed, it uh, depends on very much on a fossil fuel based energy mix with uh, refined petroleum products and natural gas being primary energy sources. However, the electricity grid is quite a bit more uh, low carbon than the general, general energy mix and about 60% of our electricity comes from hydroelectric. Much of it is the larger scale rather than as Hector was talking about the small scale run of river. Much of this is very large hydro. And this is also, we have some nuclear energy in uh, only in two provinces, uh, New Brunswick and in Ontario and then small amounts of coal, which is being phased out and uh, natural gas, which is increasing. But we also have very small amounts of wind and solar. I looked up a few statistics and we, we don't fare very uh, well compared to Chile in our energy use with about four times uh, on a per capita basis, our energy use and electricity about five times. We consume about six times more gasoline use Maybe we use the excuse of driving long distances, but that doesn't really uh, make it a, a good thing. And then a very high natural gas consumption, perhaps because Chile's natural gas consumption is low, but it also is that we, we heat a lot of our buildings with natural gas and use mm -hmm. a lot of natural gas. Just to point out that uh, the regions, uh, the different provinces are very distinct. Rodrigo pointed out that we have very distinct universities and topics of research, but we also have very distinct electricity grids uh, across Canada, with Quebec having mostly hydroelectric, uh, very low carbon, same with Newfoundland and Labrador. But then when you go to Ontario, you have a, a proportion of nuclear as well as hydro and more of a mix. And then if you go to the Western provinces, you have hydro in British Columbia, but still some reliance on coal uh, quite a bit of reliance on natural gas in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And when I give my case studies, I'll be talking about Alberta and Saskatchewan, the provinces in the West for my oil sands case study, and then mentioning the prairie provinces, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, for uh, the biofuels case study. As we see this, although we're aiming for a, uh, as announced last month, a carbon neutral by 2050, the projection by the Canada's energy regulator, part of the Canadian government, doesn't really show us increasing very much in our renewables up to 2040. So there's a, certainly a mismatch here between what will be accomplished with respect to getting to a net zero versus still extracting this much oil and uh, natural gas. So natural gas being expected to increase uh, whereas the renewables don't show very much increase, perhaps a little bit. Similar along the lines of Canada's crude oil production, and much of Canada's crude oil production is exported to the United States. So our Western provinces export the fuel to the US, but we import oil on the East Coast often. Um, and so we have some, we don't have necessarily pipelines going the full length of the country to, to, to these supplies. And whether we can perhaps capture carbon, so carbon capture on some of these facilities could be in place, but it must be understood that the vast majority of emissions are resulting from the driving of a vehicle or the use of the fuel where the combustion of the fuel occurs in the vehicle. So even if we do make improvements upstream, we're still going to have those emissions if we don't move to an electric vehicle, for example. And the in situ bitumen and mine bitumen are the oil sands products, which are shown here in orange and green, which are ex expected to substantially increase. And this is not uh, 
just an outlier for Canada, this is the same situation in places like Australia and other countries that are also expecting considerable fossil fuel production in the next decades, which is not congruent with our climate change initiatives. But this brings into place the, the just transition issues of being much employment in the West, in the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, related to the oil sector and oil and gas sector. So where, where are the emissions from can, uh, in Canada? As you see here, the oil and gas sector uh, is the, the highest followed by transportation. So both of these are large portions of emissions then followed by buildings. As mentioned, we use a lot of natural gas to, to heat buildings. There's also electricity used for buildings and then the electricity sector itself here. Canada has a large number of vehicles uh, per thousand people, 650 whereas Chile has 247. So Canadians mostly drive in their vehicles. Yes, I use public transport to get mm -hmm. to my office, the subway and, the, and walking, but there's a lot of people that are in vehicles and doing a lot of commuting. And this, even if we are to move to electric vehicles, we need to move beyond just, we have to make decisions about what we do beyond just moving from a combustion engine vehicle to an electric vehicle, we have to start moving to lower emissions modes. We have to start walking more, biking more. And these are all things that you have to consider equity aspects and things like that. Just to mention that the greenhouse gas emissions per capita or per province vary very greatly. Ontario's emissions have decreased since 2018, or sorry, since 2005 to 2018, mainly due to shutting down uh, the coal fire generating stations in the province. So Ontario no longer uses any coal in generating electricity. On the other side, Alberta has increased their oil and gas production. And even though the greenhouse gas emissions intensity on a per barrel basis has declined over that time period, production has increased resulting in increased emissions. Canada contributes less than 2% of global emissions, but has a very high per capita emissions, 20, around 20. There are different statistics, different places and how thing, people count things. Chile is about five. So we are, we are not doing well in that, in that regard. There are some reasons for this, which we can go into in discussion. And then Canada has signed the, the Paris Agreement committing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30% below 2005 levels by 2030, but we are not on target to meet this, this reduction. But there are a lot of uh, policies that have been put in place to, to make progress on this. There's the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which has a clean fuel standard which is looking to reduce the carbon intensity of transportation, building and industrial fuels over this time period to get by 2030, a 30 uh, million ton CO2 equivalent per year reduction. As mentioned last month, November, uh, the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act uh, has been announced where Canada would be either net zero emissions or would be offsetting any emissions that were still remaining, such as by planting trees or other, other ways of doing so. Uh, as Hector mentioned about the Chilean uh, policy on the just transition, we don't really know what this net zero emissions accountability act will look like. The, the government has said there will be five year plans, but at the moment it's just been announced with no details. I believe this is the 2019 uh, figures where if we didn't do anything further, Canada's emissions would increase to 815 megaton CO2 equivalent by 2030. If we went on our regular route and took no further climate action, we would make and only implemented things that were in place by September 2019, we would go down to 673. If we implement things like the clean fuel standard and other things that are not yet in place yet, but are uh, planned, then we would get to 603, but our target is 511 uh, megatons. So just briefly, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about the work we do, um, where I've done a lot of work on the oil sands, where we've looked at understanding the variability and the greenhouse gas emissions associated with all of the life cycle of uh, oil sands. 
because they are a major contributor to Canada's greenhouse gas emissions and they aren't going to disappear tomorrow. So it's important to figure out how do we reduce emissions from this sector. So on the left hand side here just shows the different stages of production upstream, the pipelining, the refining, the end use, which is uh, the combustion of the uh, end product gasoline or diesel in a vehicle, and then the full life cycle. And this is all on grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule of gasoline. And as you can see, as I mentioned before, the driving in the vehicle is the major contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions. It's the combustion of the, the fuel. And then if we look across different pathways, there's different ways of extracting the oil sands, mining or in situ uh, production. They all generally result in higher emissions than the baseline emissions that are stated under the renewable fuel standard in the US. And I guess what to, to, can be said is that they're generally higher emissions, but not higher than all other methods of production. But the industry is taking steps to make improvements and even can has shown in some projects or some technologies that they can get about a 35% reduction even, which sounds very large uh, from their upstream operations up for their upstream up to their refinery but then it still only makes about a 2% difference when you add on the vehicle operation. So it's not just about the production upstream, it, where we're talking about sort of the jobs and things like that. It's about people making choices of using the fuel in their vehicles and the efficiency of those vehicles. Another option for moving to lower carbon would be to look at different biofuels. This is a hypothetical case study of using an oil seed based crop that's that's very prominently grown on the prairies and producing a bio based jet fuel. And this case study looked at production of this biofuel in different regions where we had different types of soil, gray, black and brown. And as you can see, there's quite different, quite a lot of difference in the emissions, even though they're all lower than the fossil jet fuel. The differences stem from the differences of impacts of land use change. Because on the gray soil zones, this was sometimes perhaps a forested area, which was then converted to grow this canola crop. And so therefore there's emissions associated with the growth of that crop. And these emissions make it so that there's quite a difference in selecting to grow on the brown soil zone versus the gray soil zone. And again, this is if you start to go into some of these alternatives that you think are naturally low carbon, there's you have to look at the details on these because if you start to get into land use issues where you're taking away from food production or you're moving into zones that were earlier forested, you're going to end up releasing more emissions than, than you're sequestering in some cases. And my final, my final case study is, uh, it's a US example that uh, was a recent paper we, we published, but it would be a similar result for Canada, although I haven't yet, figure, haven't yet done that uh, analysis. But what we showed was that due to the timing of turnover of the vehicles in the fleet, that if we were aiming to meet climate goals of a two degree C increase above uh, pre-industrial levels by 2050, that about 90% of US cars would have to be electric by 2050. So almost by 2030, you'd have to be having and selling almost 100% market share of these cars in the fleet. This is so much higher than the most optimistic projections, which are about 50% as shown on the slide here, that we have to think of more options than just relying on electrification to really meet our climate goals or a just transition. We have to as mentioned, get people out of their cars, get people into active modes of transport, su support uh, public transport and things like that. So we can't just rely on technical solutions. So just a couple of discussion points that I'd be interested in perspectives on. You know, I think there's a key thing. How can Canada best balance its natural resource-based economy with the principles of a just energy transition? And I think some of our speakers coming up are gonna going to address some of these aspects. Um, and reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 will require unprecedented changes in all sectors of the economy, but not just technical aspects such as those that engineers like me think about, but also societal shifts and decisions and thinking about all of the sector, uh, all of the people that are involved in, in these. So thank you very much. Gracias. 
Thank you very much, Heather. Um, both presentations are so interesting to think about in the continent and in America, North and, and South America in different extreme, not only in the States and our challenge to think about in this North and South per capita consumptions of energy and the productions of our economies too. In this line, I have some questions, remark questions. Uh, first one is from, well, from Sh Sharapira Kakimova. <laughs> And she said, Denmark has recently announced that they will an exploration of gas and petroleum by 2015. And she said, yeah, do you think Chile and Canada can follow its example? What do you, what should be done? I make some question now to think about in this situation in different continents and countries. And uh, in particular here, there are some questions about the mm, different amounts of consumption and production. For example, in the, um, yeah, Francisco uh, Calderon said, um, said uh, questions. In the example of quarter then, how much energy supply does electrical energy account for? And, uh, Julie Dyrit from St. Mary University in Canada said, what question for Dr. Heater, what do you think is holding us back from transitioning more to sustainable source of energy? Uh, yeah, um, a little bit, she said something about it. And Daniel Ramirez from the University of Technica Federico Santa Maria, she said, why wind is so low in Canadian electricity matrix? Uh, she asked, and uh, I have another one here uh, for Hector, Alexander Benzel from the Pontificia Universidad Católica. Uh, he asked, uh, is there any study on the energy state of these uh, small communities in Chile and how they are self-sufficient in energy terms? This is some questions that there are in different uh, numbers of the demand and the studies and uh, think about in the strategies. No, for me, it was super interesting how the uh, different regions or parts geographically is taking different uh, consumptions and different challenges in different uh, regions. For us in the north is the mining sector. And I suppose in here is the, maybe it's the same. Only to think about in the relation of mining and energy. Thank you. What you want, uh, either or Hector? Maybe Hector, you can start for your time. Sure, because of the timing, we might take like two, uh, one or two questions, but uh, someone mentioned on, on the oil uh, dependency, right? I think Chile is not, uh, is not a country that produces like a lot of oil, or, but we import it a lot. And uh, it, it is the same if either you are producing or, 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 or consuming it. But we are consuming oil as, as every country in the world. And uh, oil, it's one of the most difficult ones to get rid of because uh, of the cars, basically. Transportation. Transportation, it's, uh, it's not yet, uh, I mean, electric vehicles are not yet a, a solution down here because of the price, basically. Chile, it's a... Uh, it's a country that is being uh, sort of, um, of uh, known for no, no subsidy policies. So in terms of, of, of that scenario, it is very difficult for us to get out of oil, uh, like in the midterm, unless like uh, prices for EVs uh, dropped dramatically. So that, I would say that in the case of Chile. Thank you, Hector. Um, either? Uh, I, I'm not sure of the proportion of uh, Denmark's uh, oil production, but Canada's reserves are among the third largest in the world. Um, it's a very large industry. It's a very powerful industry. And there is also a lot of tension between East and West uh, in, in Canada with respect to the that everybody benefits from having the oil sector 
but sometimes people are thinking that it is the responsibility of those provinces that have it as the producers. But as Hector has, as you know, very eloquently said, it's not just about producing, it's about using. And it's going to be a long time before we get the number of electric vehicles on the road. We do have some subsidies in, in Canada. Some provinces have more subsidy than the others, but there are still high prices generally for these vehicles. Uh, there are some challenges in cold weather with, uh, especially with battery degradation and, and distances you can drive with them, but uh, they are improving. So I think that we will move in that, in that direction. But I do feel that there has to be a, a way to clean, to have cleaner production in the oil sand sector and to have a plan of how to move forward to a world without using these types of uh, fossil fuels. But it's, it's not going to be an overnight transition. It's going to be a very long-term type of thing. That's a big challenge for the countries that produce. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah that's, that's complicated. It's not so easy to think about and, and the challenge in the infrastructure, the whole infrastructure. Um, either uh, Hector, well, no, Enrique Garces uh, asked, uh, was, what strategies are oil companies adopting in the face of the trend of electricity, uh, electric vehicles? Uh, this is one uh, maybe um, to, to take yeah, both can... of the companies of oil companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, some of the oil companies, some of the more prominent ones are trying to diversify so that they are energy companies, not so much oil companies. So some of them have invested to a limited extent in biofuels or in wind uh, turbines or are looking at other technologies. Um, they... I think all of the companies have been struggling, uh, particularly during the COVID time, but even before. So the, in, the industry has uh, canceled a number of projects that they have not felt would be uh, financially viable. Um, so I think there are increasing pressures uh, from investors and uh, banks uh, about uh, the sort of having the sustainable financing strategies. So I think that they are coming under increased pressure to ensure that because these are very, very large, large infrastructure and large mining and large projects, I think they are coming more cautious about the decisions to go ahead with projects uh, because they are very reliant on what would be the, the price per barrel of oil and Oil prices are low currently and not expected to, not projected to increase substantially for the next number of years. So I think as they see these, these different things happening, I think they're becoming a bit uh, more aware of how these things are affecting the, the sector. With respect to the, the electricity, I think they're also trying to make reductions in their upstream production, as mentioned, to, to have more efficient operations because that also saves them money. New technologies are always investing in new types of technologies. They're looking at carbon capture and storage and things like that. Most of them, some of them generate their own electricity through uh, cogeneration systems and things like that. Some of them sell that electricity back to the grid. So there is some interconnections there, but most of them are not uh, aligned sort of they're not the same sector as the electricity generating sector mm -hmm. thank you Heather. well um in some point uh, the questions about how you can move from another forms to think about and the transitions in terms of justice for example and then which way the different communities or uh how how we can trans trans make a transition in a quickly way, you know, it's super quick and you need to make this since as soon as possible. And how we maintain this, we maintain these forms of uh, productions. And in this way, there are two questions. Uh, one in Chile is one of the strategies is an hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Yes, and now we translate so quickly to hydrogen. You know, it's just a couple of really quick solutions. And uh, Hector Ortiz asked, uh, th 
Thank you for the presentation set. Uh, what is the role of hydrogen in these transitions toward reducing uh, the emissions? And why is the transition to electric vehicles only being considered and not through the use of hydrogens? Here is a big uh, questions and, and a big uh, discussions about the, these quick transitions and the new opportunity for the market. And another questions in this way is this from, uh, yeah, Francisco Calderon said, that, uh, despite international agreements, how do we encourage countries trying to reach industrial advancement through carbon oil usage, given that they we have reserve of this simple cheaper case in point India? I don't know. This is the questions a little bit about the quickly transitions. Maybe either if you have some idea. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> a lot of tough questions. Um, and Hector can jump in whenever he he likes on it. But uh, yes, hydrogen is is coming back again. Uh, it it seems to go in cycles of about a decade each, where um, the um, the interest in hydrogen sort of goes very high. And uh, then we get a little bit of the way there and then it drops down again. And then it seems to be now back again. So we are investigating uh, hydrogen production options. There has been some recent very good work in, in trying to look at and, and get to the, the market more renewable options, green and gray and you know blue and everything, different types of hydrogen where you're either coming from renewables or coming from waste CO2. Um, but the vast majority of hydrogen is still produced through natural gas, uh, steam methane reforming. And so we would have to go for a lot more production like lower GHG intensity production as long, along with an infrastructure transition as well to get the hydrogen fueling stations out there. I think that many are thinking of hydrogen for heavier duty vehicles, um, not so much the light duty vehicles, but I, I think there's still, you know, the, there's still things to weigh in the balance of, of the hydrogen, hydrogen aspects, so. Yes, yeah, any quick solution you need to think about in the overall big. solution yeah overall solution yeah um, maybe some another question uh, we can uh, make at the end of the presentation if you have more time and thank you very much Heather. yeah Hector said thank you for the opportunity but you have to leave and then return and then quickly <laughs> we go to the next uh, block um, uh, just transition into solar energy this um, okay, Jack, we follow the next, okay, we follow the next block. We have uh, two really interesting presentations. Sandeep Agrabal is professor and director of a school of urban, urban and regional planning, associate uh, chair, the faculty of science, earth and atmospheric science of the University of Alberta and director of the Faculty of Science and Earth and Atmospheric Science. His research works uh, have focused on ethnic communities and the effect of immigration, religions, and cultures on urban structures and policy, public policy. His most recent works are on urban, suburban growth in Alberta, human rights and zoning, his density rural regions of India, effects of tall buildings in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and affordable housing housing in the United Arab Emirates. It's incredible, many places. <laughs> for us, it's some uh, interesting things to research in different places. And our uh, well, our second presenter presenter is Pilar Moraga. She's professor of the University uh, de Chile, uh, the School of Law Lawyer at the University of Chile, Master on International and Communitarian Law at the University of Lille, is a PhD in Law at the University of Lille too, and she's Director of the Environmental Law Center at the University of Chile, researcher at the Center of Climate and Resilient Resilience Research, and her research work 
um, has been mainly focused on in sustainable development, environmental energy and regulations, and comparative environmental inspections. Thank you very much both. And Sandy, if you can go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria, for the introduction. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, super. All right, so I'm going to start to share my screen. I believe it's this one. Can you see my first slide? Yeah. Not, not the notes, but just the slide, right? <laughs> yes. OK. All right. OK, thank you very much um, uh, for having me uh, for this webinar. I uh, just wanted to start off by saying uh, I'm an urban planner, as uh, Gloria mentioned, uh, not a natural scientist or an economist. Uh, and um, so I, I look at energy from uh, a social scientist point of view. Uh, we have um, a grant, the University of Alberta has a, a grant from the federal government, it's called Canada First Excellence Grant. And the focus of that grant here at the University of Alberta is on future energy systems. So I have a slice of that grant looking at, again, uh, energy transition from, from social science uh, perspective. So we have a number of projects going on and essentially looking at energy transition uh, as a bottom up approach, uh, community organizations in the case of Edmonton, uh, community leagues and some of our works in, in Canada's North. So I'm gonna be touching upon uh, some of the works that, that we have done um, so far. Most of it uh, is still uh, an ongoing work. So um, getting to exactly what the webinar is about, what is uh, just transition? So according to the Government of Canada's Just Transition Task Force, uh, just transition means that society shares the costs of transitioning to a low carbon economy. And it would be unjust for workers and communities in affected sectors to shoulder the full cost of transition. So that is, that is the definition that's kind of uh, adopted across, across Canada. The 2015, the Paris Agreement also speaks about the need for a just transition. And one of the key principles of Paris Agreement is to take into account the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities. So the bottom line is that without just transition, uh, we just might risk increasing polarization on the issue of climate change, sustainable development, and, and may erode public support uh, for any action on, on climate change. So uh, in just transition, uh, what is just in just transition? Um, just transition asserts an integral relationship between economy, energy, and equity. And uh, from my point of view, just means equity. So what does equity mean? If you look at it from legal uh, jurisprudence in the Canadian context, equity is nested within the term substantive equality. Uh, what that means is that different treatment in the service of equity for disadvantaged groups is an expression of equality and not an exception to it. So, you know, we have seen the definitions and differences between equity and equality. Equality focus on creating the same starting line for everyone, uh, but equity has the goal of providing everyone with full range of opportunities and benefits with the same finish line. So that's that sort of is the difference between equity and equality. And here, when we're talking about just, we're talking about equity. Uh, this, um, what you see, um, the graphic in front of you essentially means uh, just transition is an opportunity for moving from an extractive economy to a living economy, uh, leaving no one behind. So this diagram here illustrates a strategy framework to shift from, again, an extractive economy to 
more of a regenerative economy. So uh, I will not go get into um, entire uh, country of, of Canada, I will, but just focus on two provinces, Alberta and, and the Northwest Territories. I think Heather has, has very nicely covered uh, the country uh, at the outset. So uh, the question for me when I was thinking about this webinar uh, was a transition for who, uh, who actually is involved and gets benefited from this. So in the Canadian context to date, the concept has mainly been applied in the context of the government mandated phase out of coal fired electricity generation, which Heather uh, alluded to. So currently the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia generate a significant portion of their electricity from coal. And, and these are the provinces that have thermal coal mines that are uh, a fuel source for their coal power plants. And Canada um, as a whole and, and the provinces, these provinces as well, are making effort to uh, phase out coal. And if when that happens, it will impact the workers who are involved in this industry and, and the communities that are dependent on, on this industry as well. So just transition policy have been mostly reactive when you think about it and limited to coal power workers and communities, again, within the Canadian context. Only now the focus has been shifting to think about vulnerable individuals and groups of the society, such as women, indigenous peoples and immigrants and racialized individuals who deserve much more particular attention and support in a move to a cleaner economy. Another thing which is missing here is the discussion about consumers, uh, who are the ones shouldering the brunt of the cost of power and the transition, and especially the indigenous peoples living in the remote regions of, of Canada. So as I mentioned before, I'm gonna focus on the two regions of Canada, Alberta. In this map, you see the pink uh, is Alberta on the west side and the north of uh, Alberta is uh, the Northwest Territories in light yellow. Um, and the place where I am is Edmonton uh, and right in the center of that pink, um, uh, pink area that is Alberta. So Alberta's coal phase out. So in the 80s, the coal power plants provided over 80% of Alberta's electricity accounting for 17% or more of Alberta's annual greenhouse gas emissions. And as Heather mentioned, uh, oil, sands, you know, I mean, that the whole production of oil and bitumen is, is mainly in, in uh, concentrated in Alberta. So in 2014, about 18 coal fired uh, power units produced about 55% of Alberta's electricity. Um, however, under the federal and provincial legislation, coal-fired power generation is scheduled to phase out by 2030 to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, at the end of 2019, 35% or so of electricity in Alberta was generated from coal. So you can see there was a decrease that is happening and Alberta recently set to terminate um, all coal-fired power generation by 2030. And actually it is slightly ahead of, of the curve and is scheduled to phase out um, the remaining 14 coal-fired plants by 2023, uh, again, a few years earlier than the 2030 target. So what is government doing for just transition? Um, so there are about 3,000 thermal coal jobs, almost all of them will be terminated by 2023 or so. So recognizing the economic and social risks to these workers and communities, the Alberta government created two programs a uh, coal workforce transition program, and the other one is the coal community transition fund. So coal workforce transition program essentially provides financial support to workers involved in this, in this industry. So things like employment insurance enhancement, so workers uh, would receive about 75% of uh, their previous weekly earnings to a maximum of 45 weeks, uh, income enhancement of workers who are approaching retirement, um, so that is the, another one. The third is um, giving 
you know, payouts to, to workers if they wish to locate, relocate themselves away from where the, your, their current job is. And they're also being uh, given tuition vouchers uh, to go to any post-secondary education and retrain themselves in some other field. The Coal Community Transition Fund is to assist Alberta communities uh, affected by coal phase out. So municipalities, First, Nation, uh, First Nations uh, communities um, could apply for this fund and, and, and that is meant to support their economic development initiatives. Um, the fund is currently about $5 million, but almost all of it has been exhausted as of 2017. Uh, but I believe the federal government has stepped in recently with, with more cash for, for this fund. Alberta's carbon tax, I just want to touch upon that because I talked about the consumers. So in 2015, the NDP government at that time brought carbon tax on every Albertan as emitters of, of GHG uh, gas emissions to help combat climate change and reduce emission. It included some partial rebates for low income earners, um, but uh, Alberta, the new government uh, has a, repealed the provincial carbon tax in 2019 uh, because it thought that it was adding financial burden to families and, and, and to, to employers. But critics uh, say that carbon pricing directly affects uh, household consumption and, and can, can only work if, if there are alternatives for cleaner options available and are affordable. Moving to uh, Northwest Territories. Um, so Northwest Territories account for a very small portion of Canada's total annual greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at the, the amount of land mass that's there, there are about 17 to 18,000 people who live there. But despite the Northwest Territories low total greenhouse gas emissions, per capita emissions for the Northwest Territories are well above the national average. And the higher per capita emissions are due to long distances between communities, uh, energy intensive resource industries that are there. Every community is, is powered by diesel run power generation units, the long cold winters, most of the communities are are like only fly in and fly out. So you can see the geography has a lot to do with uh, what's happening in the Northwest Territories. So we conducted a study which was more about, um, so we were invited by the First Nations government um, and we were asked to look at the issues around homelessness and housing in indigenous communities. And what we found was that the high cost of power is one of the leading contributing factors to homelessness and housing inst uh, instability in Canada's North. So I'll give you some figures. So one study participant who, who lived in his, his private home uh, complained about the high cost of a power as being prohibitive and making him live in his home unaffordable and rendering him homeless. And I'll give you some numbers. So um, someone living in, in Northwest Territory pay about 35 cents per kilowatt uh, for power. There are some subsidies available, but let's just for the sake of argument, take 35 cents per kilowatt hour. The average Canadian electricity price uh, is around 13 cents kilowatt uh, hour. So assuming an average monthly use of 415 kilowatt in Northwest Territories, a household in Northwest Territory would have to pay as much as about $145, $150 per month. Many in indigenous communities are on government support income and government support income is about $600 per month. So if you do the math, one third of their income may just go towards power. And if they cannot pay, then the power company comes and then they terminate their services and now they are literally out in the cold. In a couple of communities that I have looked at, about 10% of the community members were completely homeless and they were out on the street. So you can see the extent of issue caused by uh, the, the, the cost of power. So the indigenous communities are bearing the disproportionate burden uh, because of the use of fossil fuel 
and there are reasons about remote region um, of, uh, of these communities, transportation cost of hauling diesel. So during the winter time, diesel is transported to these communities and they are stored and then they are burned uh, to generate power. Many communities are accessible during winter months or winter months are getting shorter and shorter. So you could just imagine the situation. The other issue is that uh, Northwest Territories is not connected to the North American grid. So even if they produce excess amount of power, it just cannot be pushed on to the grid. And then, then the last point is not enough incentive available uh, for them to transition. So again, we did a small study asking participants um, uh, what would it take to transition to clean energy? And, and, and um, so essentially what will happen is they'll have to bear a higher burden of moving to clean power. And, and there are um, several factors to it, high cost of renewable projects. Technology is not there to store extra power generated during summer months. So if you have solar panel, you have 22, 23 hours of sunlight, you can generate a lot of power but then what are you gonna do with that power? Because it's not, you can't store it because you don't have the technology. You can't send it to over to some other community because they're just not connected. Remoteness of com uh, community increases the production cost. Uh, the economy of scale is an issue. So everywhere, whatever needs to be done has to be done for that community. And, and eventually what will happen is the cost of power will increase and so, so you can just see there are numerous challenges and barriers um, that are in play. So what is being tried are hydro, so small turbines for each community because may, most of them are located near lakes or rivers and things like that. Uh, biomass, solar are being tried as well. Uh, biomass wood pellets is, is one that actually being used more often and, and hydro is being, being looked at as well. So at the end, I'll just make a few remarks. Uh, the focus in just transition should go beyond just those involved in the coal-fired power plants. Uh, indigenous communities in remote regions of Canada are facing the brunt of higher power cost and transitioning in these regions face serious challenges. Tra just transition should include all of those employed in the non-renewable energy-driven industries, as well as those who are consumers of the non-renewable power sources as we saw in the Canada's North. And lastly, I would say that the Canadian Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms and Human Rights legislation should be used as guides uh, in this process to transitioning. So I will end with that and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandeep, to translate us to these faraway communities and to I can recognize many aspects of the energy poverty of this uh, community. No? And uh, yeah, Pilar, we make the question after both presentations. And Pilar, it's your turn. Yes. Can you see my presentation? Perfect. Yes. Because not, not, not me. <laughs> uh -huh. Ah, you don't. I can't. No, I can't. So uh, I try, try again. Oh. Yes, we can see, or... Uh, excuse me, no, I can't see. Maybe. I don't know why. We see perfect, maybe if you see. Wait, but I can't, I can't see my presentation. Maybe you have some things open and you can close another yes another software mm -hmm. or, or really sorry. In another extreme you can send it to Jack and yes, yes, yes I think maybe you, you can send it to me yes. so so I I put it on. Okay. And maybe uh, meanwhile there's a question that probably Sandeep could, could answer. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. yes, I tried, well, maybe Sandeep, could you uh, answer the question of, um, <laughs> that, uh, I don't remember the name, let me see, uh, the people are worried about why wind energy is not so important in Canadian electricity metrics. It's the, the question of Daniel Mar Ramirez, he, he wants to 
make the questions again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think th there is there is a increasing move towards uh, wind energy, uh, wind power. Um, it's not there yet, um, but you could see, and I can speak from Alberta's perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just depends upon where that kind of um, power is available. That means wind power is available. So if you go on the southern part of Alberta, you would see a number of wind turbines uh, are coming up. Um, over the years in Alberta, um, the share of wind power has, in, has increased. It actually, it has doubled, but still about it's four to five percent of the total energy. Mm -hmm. uh, it has also to do with um, political ideologies um, uh, across the country, uh, provinces view. Um, wind power in different ways. I remember when I was in Ontario, uh, before moving to Alberta, the then government uh, tried to move to, to wind power and there were a lot of pushback from, from the rural parts of Ontario uh, talking about all kinds of externalities attached with, with wind turbines and such. But I think I think I think it is it is moving in the right direction, but very slowly. I agree on that on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, this uh, questions about the imaginaries and <laughs> the political imaginations of the transitions. Okay, now we see Pilar your presentation. Do you can? I I can I can see. So okay, right. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, today, I would like to share with you the Chilean way to carbon neutrality to 2050. And I would first like to address the main step, steps to improve green energies in the country and then to talk about the contents of the climate change bill, its purpose, instruments, and the citizen participation. I will later refer, later refer to the opportunities in front of a new Chilean constitution and some reflection about the role of climate legislation. So, Concerning the main steps to improve the green energies in Chile, I have to mention two important acts to promote it. The first one is the 2008 Green Energy Act, and second one, it is its reform in 2013. The Green Energy Act established a creeping obligation for energy marketer which consisted to sell 10% of green energy to 2024. Five years later, this act was reformed and replaced the obligation by an energy blocks bid system. This reform increased the objective from 10% to 20%. Nevertheless, today, we overcame the per this purpose, as you can see in this slide, which represents green energy power installed capacity in October, which is uh, 26%. And you can see too the evolution of solar energy. In fact, the energy ministry stimulated solar energy development across a particular regulation reform, and it separated the day and night bid. The consequences of that were very important in terms of growing solar energy generation. In fact, today, the most installed clean energy technologies in Chile are the solar, then the wind, and third place, the mini hydraulics. Although at present, 
there is a great interest of the public and private sector to promote them all, including bioenergy, geothermal energy, and promptly of solar power concentration. Now, how is the expectation related with this energy in the next decades? The objectives of energy policy is that by 2050, 70% uh, of the energy consumed in Chile is from source such as solar, thermal, photovoltaic, and wind energy, which adds to the announcement of the decarbonization plan. This objective coexists with the equitable and universal good energy, as you can see in this slide, which shows the 10 objectives of energy policy to 2050. Now, concerning the climate change bill, we can identify four parts of the bill's legislative process of enactment. The first one is government announcement in July 2018. Second, start, second one, start of regional and sectoral discussion in the country between December 2018 and January 2019. Third, public consultation of the bill in July 2019. And last one, the Scientific Council during the parliamentarian debate. This is, is very important. In fact, in last October, the Environmental Congress Commission with Environmental Ministry invited to CR2, the Climate and Resilient Research Center financed by ANID, to counsel to parliamentarian discussion in view to share the technical perspective. Concerning the goal of this climate change bill, it is establishes the purpose of the law in the first article, which purpose to move the country toward a low greenhouse gas emission development until achieving carbon neutrality, thus increasing resilience to the adverse effects of climate change and achieving compliance with Chile's international commitments. It also establishes a goal in its Article 4, which is to reach greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. The bill defines the institutional framework of climate change within which the three levels of gover government, national, regional, and local, the Ministry of Environment can continues to be responsible for drafting and implementing climate policies and coordinated with the other sectors, several of which for the first time will have an exclusive legal mandate over climate change related matters, similar to the case of regional and local governments. Now, concerning, concerning instruments, as for the instrument provided in the bill, for the first time public policy instrument, such as the action plan and national Act adaptation plan, as well as sectoral plan, will be legally in Unshire. Now, the big novelty in the bill is the recognition of a long term climate strategy and NDC as an instrument for climate management. The idea we can see in this slide is the NDC defines the national goals, the climate long term strategy, the sectorial goals, and the sectorial plans defines the specific measures to reach the carbon neutrality to 2050. Excuse me. Now, 
An important aspect of this bill is the citizen participation uh, or process, because each of those climate management instruments sets forth a participation process. In fact, public participation is an instance that has been systematically incorporated into the process of enacting policies, regulation, and plans either by legal mandate or even in the absence thereof. In that context, all climate change action and adaptation plans, even NDC, have included instance of public consultation. Nevertheless, it is worth noting that this process still presents certain deficiencies it what it is we are proposing is for public consultation to serve as a mechanism to obtain input in order to define public policy. Now, what is the opportunities which provide uh, the constitutional debate opportunity, uh, constitutional debate in front to a new uh, Chilean constitution? During, uh, as a result of the social crisis in Chile, the political parties agreed to move toward a new social agreement that would replace the current constitution. The origins of which that back to uh, 1918, and which entered into force during the dictatorship of Pinochet. Establishing a neoliberal economic that today the social movement perceives as the source of the country's existing social inequality. Again, this backdrop, the upcoming discussion on a new constitution will touch upon which is what we who support democratic system are hoping for fundamental issue issues for climate change governance and the new development model, which cannot leave out carbon neutrality. In terms, of, in terms of governance, the role of the state needs to be defined. As we know, the state currently, currently has a subsidiary role in economic matters, which witness in the face of circumstances that uh, require responses that privilege the people's interest over individual interest, especially in the context of a changing climate and a vulnerable country such as Chile. At the same time, we can start thinking about boosting the role of the territories by strengthening the governance of local and regional government vis-a-vis -vis the excessive centralism that currently exists in our country. As for the development model in the Chilean neoliberal constitution context, economic rights enjoy greater protection than the right to a healthy and balanced environment. The new constitution therefore opens the door to unshiring other rights, such as the right to a stable climate, right of nature, future generation, and the human right to water, for example. And to finish, uh, we can conclude or we can affirm the climate laws are necessary because they are the only way to make the nationally determinate contribution or NDC binding in view of a just transition to carbon neutrality. Such climate act must also benefit from a strong social, social societal support. This means they need to be accompanied or preceded at some stage by an inclusive process and positive nar narrative in terms of responsibility of each sector and stakeholders 
and different capacity of uh, communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pilar. Uh, yeah, it's uh, incredible to think about in this new strategy in terms of the constitutional processes for the pressures of the citizenships to destabilize the energy before. Uh, maybe the Canadian colleagues uh, don't know that the destabilization or the different, this change uh, in, in the uh, renewable energy strategies come came from the pressures of the society in front of different forms of energy productions and big dams and coal fire power plants that was so uh, complicated to follow this line. And then uh, this um, pressures of the citizenship uh, cross with the new markets and opportunity. But um, I think it's an, a big challenge for us to think about in the participations and different constitutional practices from below because the people are so sensitive and in this uh, thing to follow, uh, to change and uh, the transition and more in, in, in terms of the transformation. We said sometimes the transformation and to think about. Maybe um, I'd like to uh, make a question for Sandeep and another from Pilar. Uh, from my own, uh, Carla Vidal from the University of Santiago. She's my doctoral student. <laughs> and she said, Canada has different indigenous group, groups in general. Are all of them, of them under inequality access of energy? And are there local uh, initiatives among indigenous groups focus on the have a better energy access? Uh, and another question for Pilar. Uh, what do you think about Pilar about the new law uh, of the um, prosumers, uh, uh, prosumers, so the consumption of the energy and uh, community level? Now that all this law to make the own people in in the urban places or in off grid as a energy communities, how do you think about in in this part of the? maybe in the in justice things and then just take questions. Thank you. So I'll try to answer Carla's question. Uh, first of all, very, very good question. Yes, um, um, Canada has um, all different kinds of indigenous peoples. Um, you have First Nations and Métis communities, the Inuits uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I haven't looked at all of different um, indigenous communities. The ones that I have worked with in the Northwest Territories, uh, mainly the Tlicho people, the Satu, the Dene, and a and, and few others. Um, what I have seen is that most of them have uh, issues in accessing and building upon transitioning to clean and energy sources. There is an, um, an advocacy, energy advocacy group, it's called Arctic Energy Alliance. Um, so most of these First Nations governments as well as territorial government working with this organization to move to reduce consumption. So Arctic Energy Alliance has put together uh, a cheap, um, an energy efficient wood stove. And essentially what it does is it does not rely so much on the diesel produced electricity to heat the home, but it can use the, the biomass that's available, the wood that's available uh, in and around that area and to, to heat the home, for instance. Uh, the other one, as I mentioned, is about the, the biomass pellets and the wood pellets. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, being used as well. But the issue is the pellets are not, not produced uh, within the territory. It's actually produced in Saskatchewan, which is like <laughs> two provinces <laughs> down. So you can see still there's a cost and, and greenhouse gas emissions involved in transporting the pellets over to, to uh, different uh, locations in the Northwest Territories and then and then use them for heating purposes. 
So I think some of these kernel of um, ideas and, and, and experiments that are happening, but again, not to the scale that we could say that, that they have achieved equality. Um, diesel is still the main, absolutely the main source of energy production. I have been there during the thick of the winter in January and February. And as I mentioned, because of the climate change, the winter roads, the, the life of the winter roads has have shortened quite a bit. So you could see like diesel trucks, like going one after the other, because they have to, you just have essentially two months in the entire year to store a year worth of diesel in these communities across Northwest Territories for them to burn the diesel and produce power. So still it's, it's I would say it's a 97, 98% that's still diesel based. Um, but a few things are happening and hopefully it will improve um, over the next few years. But it requires government subsidies. Uh, the power corporation there has to move in this direction and some real major barriers have to be um, struck down for things to, to move quickly. Yeah, we, we have uh, many, in, co in co comparative terms, we have some things in common with uh, some communities in the south mm -hmm. of uh, Chile that Hector showed before. Just yeah. one little thing I wanted to add that let's say even if there is a new technology out there and I have seen there's a few things, let's say just say a solar panel. But if something goes wrong with the solar panel, they just don't have the maintenance people, the technicians to fix them. So once it gets broken for years and years, it just sits there and they, they switch to whatever is the conventional means of getting the power. So yeah. that's another yeah. issue. Yeah, yes. The repairing and maintenance and skills is super important. Yes, <laughs> agree. Pilar. Yes, uh, concerning the community's energy, no? Um, I, in my opinion, it's the best solution for Chile uh, if we consider the geography, the, where the, we have a lot of community where are isolated and the power generation in the local power generation is the fantastic solution for us. But the problem is for, for me in my opinion, is the, uh, the, the capacity, for example, for solar energy, the capacities or is, is a problem because we don't have capacity in all territory. So uh, this is a problem we, if we want to, to develop this uh, type of uh, energy or technology in, in the communities. And I, I have, I think the the laws, the legislation is not doesn't doesn't have focus in the local generation uh, of energy. Uh, the the focus is the national system, and it's very difficult to to think to improve the local development. Uh, I think uh, it's because to state organization, the centralism of the state. So the, the policy is a na national policy and not the local uh, policies. It's very difficult to, to go to uh, there. So yes, but it's, I, I think it's necessary to, to work in, in this uh, model. Yeah, this is a good opportunity to learn about the yeah the other countries with different uh, federals or decentralized uh, policies. This is one of the things that we have to to think more about the the, the centrality the decentralization. Thank you very much, Pilar and Sandeep. Magnific presentation. We follow for the next uh, block. Uh, just transition management and indigenous communities. Yeah, more a specific way. I present Martin Tironi, this professor for the School of Sociology and the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. 
He's sociologist, a master of city and regional planning at the Cornell University mm -hmm. and a PhD in urbanism at the University of Poly Politecnica de Catalunya. With Martin, we share with the energy and society millennium nucleus, nucleus. His main research area are science and technology social studies, well, science and technology studies, environmental sociology and uh, uh, urban sociology. And uh, next is Greg Pulse, I suppose this is the pronunciation, is professor at the School of uh, Environmental and Sustainability at the University of Goa. Sak Saskatchewan, <laughs> Bachelor in Political Science at the University of Alberta, a PhD Political Science at the University of Alberta too. His main research area are renewable energy in Northern, remote and indigenous community, comparative energy policy and energy transitions, social and economic value of community energy development, indigenous state relations, economic reconciliations, negotiations, consultations, and social license to operate. Thank you very much. Greg, maybe you can start and then Manuel, and then follow the, the questions. Uh, you are mute, and um, you, you need to unmute, Greg. Thanks. Um, I think your mic is all right. I cannot ah, yes, hear okay. you, Greg. Ah, we can hear you, Greg. No, Greg, we can't hear you. Uh, we, we can't hear. Maybe we, we can start with the Manuel's presentation, if you both agree. And meanwhile, do you, you try to fix this problem. Manuel? Yeah. Sure, sure. Greg, you have to stop the presentation a little bit. And I suggest you to see the, yeah, the mic in your PC. Shall I begin? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me uh, share. Okay. Good. Mm. Can you see my presentation? It's charging. Now, yes. OK. Good. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, invitation. Um, I'm Manuel uh, Tironi. Gloria already introduced me. So I I'll go right ahead to the matters uh, that matters the most uh, for all of us. And, and in order to be um, provocative and to take advantage of my 15 minutes, I just want to say what's the main kind of idea or proposition that I want to say today. And, and, and that is that I think that collaboration with indigenous communities for energy transitions requires restituting their self-determination. Um, and, and, and I have to say as well that I'm not sure I'm not completely sure if liberal democracies, uh, beginning with Chile, are, are truly ready to accept this condition. And, 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 and I think that the reason why self-determination needs to be restituted in order to, um, to think about indigenous collaborations for energy transitions is because it's because that's the only way to secure a, a, a robust answer to the critical questions of energy transitions, right? Uh, energy for what? Energy for whom? Energy where and how? 
right? Uh, so I think that uh, basically what I'm trying to say is, is that when it comes to uh, indigenous collaborations for energy transitions, we need to move from a framing on environmental justice to a framing on decolonization. So let me first say something uh, more theoretical about what I'm trying to say. Uh, I, I think that it is first really important to understand that when we talk about um, interventions for sustainable transitions, we rely on shared assumptions of, of, of around or, 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 or of what the world is, what's the problem with the world and how we should fix those problems, right? So for example, take, let, let's take, for example, let's, let's take a look at this charismatic number, right? 1.5 degrees uh, uh, and the force that this number has propelling policy. Uh, as you all know, uh, 1.5 Celsius degrees is the average warming threshold after which climate, climate related risk uh, to human health, to livelihoods, to food security, to water supply, etc., increases dramatically, right? So th this 1.5 has become like the share uh, assumption um, um, uh, against which policies are being designed and applied. But, 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 but a lot of communities are saying, for example, that framing as a shared assumption that we need to tackle this 1.5 is really abstracting uh, local experiences uh, and even conflicts over climate change that occur at the local uh, level. It, uh, it is also uh, uh, this number, right? Like framing this uh, around uh, 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 an average degree depoliticizes a lot uh, the really important debate around the root causes of climate change, right? Industrialism, capitalism, colonialism, mm -hmm. and, and technifies uh, too much the debate, uh, kind of rendering invisible other issues that are not technical, but are cultural, political, institutional. So um, uh, what, what I'm really trying to say is that when we assume that there is a common world right? We left many other worlds or many other share assumptions outside. And, 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 I, and I think about this outside as the uncommon, right? This, this other ways, so these other assumptions that are relegated outside the common common, so, so to speak. Uh, and that uncommon is either assumed as supplemental value, so something that you can integrate but all, always as, as something that, that complement that supplement, supplements scientific value or or, 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 or this uncommon is viewed or, or is integrated as a vision that needs to be educated so there is something that is wrong basically or even you know like this is the extreme that something is something that is completely unthinkable right? So for example, when some, somebody says that a river is a person, that's, that's, completely, that's completely outside any kind of reasoning that is acceptable. So what, I'm, what I think is that when, when, when indigenous people, indigenous communities are invited to a conversation about tr energy transitions, there is already a commoning of a commons in which the common of of, of uh, indigenous uh, uh, communities is rendered uncommon, right? Mm. So it's an, invitate, in an invitation in which the commons is, one type of commons is given for granted, right? So here the challenge I think is not how to give a voice to um, indigenous communities, but how to accept a world that has many words inside it, a world that that accepts and that uh, is composed by many commons and not just by one common. So let me now briefly take you to uh, the, where, the place, the territory where, where I've been doing research for the last uh, three or four years. Uh, and let me take you a little bit, just a brief note around lithium uh, or, or uh, 
uh, what is being called the white gold yeah. of, of sustainable transitions. Uh, as you may know, lithium is, the, is, is a very light metal mineral and it's an excellent, uh, brilliant conductor, electricity conductor. So, uh, so uh, it has become, right, uh, lithium, a key element for the um, for for um, batteries, both for electric vehicles and for energy storage for re renewable renewable grids. And as you know, transportation um, is one of the key um, uh, contributors to gas uh, to to to, um, to um, greenhouse gas gases. So electromobility has become a key intervention for reducing. Um, greenhouse gases emissions and for and for the defossilization of the energy matrix and everybody right is so excited about electromobility and about the possibility of uh, defossilizing uh, uh, transportation at large. Um, wh where where does the where does lithium comes from right? Uh, 33% of all lithium is under the Atacama salt flat in here in Northern Chile, right? It's the largest, largest reservoir of lithium brine in the world. Um, and, and, and as, and as uh, Tia Rio Francos has said, probably, right, if you think about the Atacama salt flat and where all this lithium for, for uh, electric vehicle uh, batteries is taken, is, is extracted, is the extractive frontier of renewable energy transitions, right? So uh, uh, huge, uh, uh, immense amount of lithium brine is taken from the Atacama salt flat to support uh, the green life, so to speak, of wealthy people in the North that buy um, um, uh, electric vehicles, but you know, uh, at the cost of huge environmental damages in the south, specifically in the Atacama salt flat, among other salt, salt flats in Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Uh, what is important uh, for this conversation is that the uh, Salar de Atacama, right, where the Atacama salt flat, where the lithium, where the lithium brine is extracted, is part uh, of the Licanantai Lican territory. Uh, Licanantai. The Likanantai culture, the Likanantai nation, uh, is composed by 18 communities that have been that have inhabited the territory of the South Flats for the last 1,200, 12,000 um, uh, wow. years. Uh, is part the Likanantai community is part, of course, of a larger translocal Andean territory uh, of in, in the highlands of the Andes. Um, and what is important is that uh, is to take into account that the, that due to the evaporation system utilized for the extraction of lithium brine, millions of liters of water are extracted daily from the very same salt flat, right? Because in order to produce one ton of lithium brine, you require two tons of of of, of water. So this has produced an amazing amount of uh, effects on the territory, right? The desiccation of phreatic waters, diversity loss, agricultural damages, and community tensions for all of the above, of course. And very important, uh, critical for this conversation is to understand that for the for Likanantai communities, uh, the salt flat is way more than just, just uh, the uh, reservoir of minerals, right? The salt flat, the salt flat is a tutelar being uh, and, and, and the economic, social and spiritual life of Likanantai communities is organized around the salad, around the salt flat, right? So the key question here is what kind of common good is at play and who defines what, what the common is here, right? Uh, have people uh, ask for the for Likanantai community communities what, what sustainability is? Can their can their commons 
can can the definition of the commons made by the Canaan tech community themselves be accounted okay. for? Mm. So let me let me just give you a glimpse of three really concrete situations in which uh, what is common for Likanantite communities becomes or is rendered uncommon for energy transitions and for experts um, uh, in, in, at the state level or at the industry level, right? So first, what is a salar? What is a salt flat? So we know, of course, that uh, salt flats are endorheic basins that, that develop around volcanic calderas. Uh, but at the same time, in the territory for Licanante communities, a salt flat is an abuelo, is a grandfather, is an ancestor. A salar is, is part of your family, right? So the, the salt flat uh, becomes part, it, 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 it invokes relations of kinship, right? So <laughs> what is important? is that the logic of transactions, uh, the logic of transactional mechanisms and legal arrangements is not enough to understand and to deal with what is going on at this, in the salt flats. Because what is, what is in, play, in play here is not an issue of justice for legal and anti communities or not only an issue of justice, but an issue of care, a care mm. for a loved one. Mm. Secondly, who, who are, who are the experts? Of course, in, the, in, in, in this territory, a, a lot of, there is like a profusion, there is like a multiplicity uh, and an increasing, increasing quantity of workshops, meetings, seminars uh, that try to uh, um, include communities in participatory um, decision-making processes. But, but, but in these processes, uh, some expertises are not accounted for. For example, I've been working with a Yatiri, uh, a, a shaman, right? And, 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 and a critical question for Likanantai communities is whether a, a shaman, a Yatiri, can be considered, can be included as an energy transition expert, since a Yatiri is an expert on the, on the salt flat. Uh, so the, 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 the main kind of challenge here, I think, is how to include substantially, not supplementally, but with the full force of their governance value, place-based and time-sustained science, or what the people with, with or how my interlocutors call uh, ancestral science, right? Not only as something that is supplemental to Western science, but as something that is rich uh, in itself and by itself. And finally, uh, uh, energy, while the discourse on energy transition is really marked by this inc incrementality, right? Like changes should move slowly and incrementally. Uh, people in the territory, Likan and Thai communities are really thinking about stopping about uh, liberating the salt flat from the mining industry. So the key question here is whether to cease, to undo, to dismantle systems is something that can be included in processes or uh, designs for energy transitions. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that the transition um, discourse uh, is ready to accept uh, this kind of more radical uh, interventions as something that can be and must be done, right? So I think that here, what is at play or what is, it, what is at stake here is what um, Audra Simpson called refusal, right? Or the sovereign right of indigenous communities to say, we will not, we don't want, right? To, uh, to finish, I'm already, I'm already above my time. But I think that uh, given these con conditions and situations, the key question, of course, here is what do we do, right? How do we, where do we go from here? And I think, and I'm convinced that indigenous science collaborations and dialogues uh, for energy transitions can and must be achieved, that's for sure. But it requires uh, acknowledging, acknowledging 
the uncommonalities, right? Or put differently, it requires to begin conversations without assuming a common world, right? And, and, and we can say that that's the basis, that's the key uh, element of decolonization, right? Not to assume that there is a common world, but we should discuss what, what is common and what is, what is a world. And, and, and this is interesting because if we go to the literature on transitions and we accept this definition, which I think is great, that, that defines transitions as processes that lead to fundamental shifts. So I think the question that indigenous communities posed to us is which processes, what shift, and what does fundamental mean, right? And I think that the, and, the, and, and it's here where I think that the restitution of self-determination is the only mechanism to avoid uh, the logic of recognition, right? That is to invite indigenous people, but just as supplemental value, right? Just to enrich what we, what we already know and what, what we already assumed as being good or, or valuable uh, or efficient. And I think in Chile right now, something that Pilar was saying, we're in a key moment. We are we are uh, we are under we are uh, we are in um, we are under we are undergoing a constitutional process that opens multiple possibilities for thinking these uncommon commons. Right. First, let me say, let me just show you that a recent uh, survey uh, showed that 95 percent of people in Chile. Is, it's, it's in favor of, of granting uh, or indigenous people, indigenous, indigenous nations in Chile, constitutional recognition, right? So this is very important because I think there are many ways in which the constitution could open possibilities for thinking this common world otherwise. Pluri plurinationality, of course, that's the most kind of radical, but, but we can think about other models for the state, like a federal state, uh, we can grant uh, rights to nature. We can um, uh, we can uh, uh, add to the constitution direct and local democracy resources. What is key here, I think, is that we need to find another way to uh, engage with co uh, indigenous communities. We, we need to find kind of like a diplomatic encounter, as uh, philosopher Isabel Stenger uh, says. Uh, so to engage in more careful and generous negotiations without assuming a priori that, the, that there is a common world, uh, but, but to, uh, we need to assume that what a world is, is a discussion that we have to take all together collectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel, for this radical presentations, thinking about another kind of cracks, cracks not only to extract and to make another ontological questions. Greg, are you ready? Let's see. You can hear me now, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, let's see if we get this going here. Perfect, we have left off. And I, I want to, uh, first and foremost, uh, give a huge thank you to Anit and, and Caldo for uh, this presentation uh, opportunity and to share uh, with your colleagues uh, from uh, uh, Chile. Uh, it's, uh, I knew there was commonalities. I didn't realize there are that many commonalities between uh, Chile and Canada. So I, I've learned uh, absolutely a, a tremendous amount and it's uh, uh, very humbling. Um, it is our tradition at the University of Saskatchewan to acknowledge her, that we're on uh, Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of, of the Métis and uh, that uh, we recognize that we are all uh, treaty peoples uh, in Saskatchewan uh, in, uh, and of course Canada. And for those of you who have seen that earlier map of uh, Saskatchewan, uh, and I know when we always have international partners, they, they trip over Saskatchewan every time trying to say it. But it's very simple when you draw it. So I always say uh, Saskatchewan, very simple to draw, <laughs> very hard to say. But uh, today I want to talk about the, the tremendous opportunity. Um, and uh, I think Manuel, you set up uh, very kindly uh, in terms of a framework thinking about 
renewing Indigenous relations, and this is the perspective from Canada, uh, through renewable energy and negotiating Indigenous pathways into the electricity sector. And I think this is deadly important. And just to start off, as your presentation, I think, uh, showed, energy transition to a low, a low carbon future and green energy in and of itself doesn't mean it's good energy, it, depending on how it's done and who's participating and who benefits. And I, I think these are critically important questions and why even people might want energy can be very different in indigenous communities than, than in uh, what we'd call in Canada and Southern uh, communities like the city I'm in right now, Saskatoon, Toronto, Edmonton, and so forth. So what I wanted to talk about uh, uh, briefly, uh, our province, our motto is called a land of living skies. So I wanted to share one of uh, our skies from a uh, sky picture from Saskatchewan. But it's, uh, I wanted to start off a bit about the context of the energy transition in Canada and uh, particularly indigenous peoples uh, place in it as it's seen. The kind of pathways that are currently underway uh, around energy transitions in Canada in involving or impacting Indigenous peoples. Talk a little bit about the value proposition. And then given we're all academics, I thought I'd throw in a little bit. We've heard a little bit of hints uh, along the way of the role of universities uh, in how we can contribute. So if we start off with the map uh, and this map here, uh, we produced with our good colleagues at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska, uh, Fairbanks and ourselves here at the U of S. This is looking at the world from the North Pole perspective down. So if you're in outer space looking down on the, the, on the world globe and Canada is here, Alaska is here, Russia, uh, Scandinavia, Greenland. If you look on the map, each one of these red dots represents an off-grid off community that's not connected to a regional or national grid. And you can see across Canada, we have many, many, many uh, communities that are not connected to electrical grids. If you look at Scandinavia up here, uh, you can see, of course, all communities are connected to a national grid system. And that's a very, very important distinction. The southern part of Canada, everyone is grid connected uh, pretty much, except some coastal areas in British Columbia. We do have these darker gray areas that you see are regional grids that are not tied to the North American grid. But even here in my home uh, province here of Saskatchewan, you see this funny S shape, which is the northern grid. Saskatchewan has actually two electrical grids, one in the north, one in the south that are not connected to one another. And for those of you with electrical or electricity utility background, uh, you'll note that our Northern grid is actually, is a potpourri as they would say, kind of a potluck of a single phase and three phase wired uh, system, transmission line system. So the reliability factor is very difficult. On top of it, the transmission lines are in Pre-Cambrian shield on rock, bolted to rock, so they're not grounded. So 800 kilometers of transmission line, when there's an electrical event, like a thunderstorm, electrical storm, the entire grid is down and people are without electricity. And I think that's important to, to put into context. So there's a lot of end of line communities. So it's not just the off-grid communities uh, that have challenges, but also grid connected communities. Context, in off-grid, uh, we have over 280 off-grid diesel communities representing about 200,000 uh, Canadians. And 144 of those communities are indigenous communities. And to put it in perspective of energy justice terms, uh, indigenous peoples make up about 5% of the Canadian population, but they make up half or 50% uh, of the off-grid diesel communities. So this transition of affecting off-grid diesel communities is largely not exclusively, but largely an indigenous uh, issue in Canada and Northern uh, issue. And to put the other piece into context is energy costs. When we're talking about indigenous communities, we're talking among some of the poorest communities in Canada uh, by quite a bit. 
and but their electricity costs are very high. So if you look at uh, Nunavut, which is in the uh, northeastern Arctic of Canada, uh, the subsidized rate is 28.4 cents per kilowatt hour in Canadian cents uh, for the first thousand kilowatt hours, first megawatt in uh, winter, megawatt hour, and 700 uh, kilowatt hours in the summer. And above that, residents are charged the, an unsubsidized rate. So in a place like Iqaluit, which is the territorial capital, residents pay 56.7 cents, but they pay 112 cents in, in Kugaruk uh, by comparison. In my home process, if you're living in the city of Saskatoon, you only pay 14 and a half cents. So you might have a family income that's 400% higher, but your, our rates are actually a fraction. And when you and I showed you that map that even the grid communities in places like Saskatchewan, um, many of those homes are actually on electrical heating, uh, which means about two thirds of the homes. So when you're paying very high rates, these ones aren't. Most of these are not on uh, electric heating, though there is electricity heating, baseboard heating. But to put those kind of things in context, so there's a vulnerability uh, and a very high cost. Well, the federal government in the election of 2019, and you see one of the uh, uh, diesel trucks, my good colleague from uh, Alberta uh, was talking about earlier today. There's a, an example of the trucks he was uh, talking about. Um, the Liberal Party won the last election, but it was built into their, into their election platform that the goal is by 2030 to have all indigenous communities off diesel and on clean energy. And that's a very huge lift, whether it's run of uh, uh, river, hydro, wind, solar, uh, and there's possibilities actually for uh, low temperature geothermal uh, possibilities as well. Uh, we're actually doing that in Saskatchewan, low temperature geothermal electricity production is going to be built. Um, but that's a big, huge commitment. I, you know, Realistically, are we going to hit that target? Probably not. Um, <laughs> We'll try to get there, of course, as a country, but but uh, it's a lot of challenges. And what are those challenges? Part of it is policy and regulatory challenges. Part of it that was raised uh, earlier uh, by our uh, Chilean colleagues was around human capacity. And uh, of course, the need for capacity building. And then the third is around uh, financial capital, uh, investments in energy, uh, infrastructure is not cheap. But uh, in Canada, I would argue we have a once in a lifetime, uh, once in a generation opportunity to actually build uh, economic reconciliation. So reconciliation is official policy, reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and other Canadians is formal policy. It, it comes out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, that uh, actually originated because of the, the boarding schools or residential schools uh, system with uh, uh, Indigenous Canadians. And now what is becoming in the term is the notion of economic reconciliation, which is refining it further. It's kind of sharing the wealth, sharing the opportunities and truly building Canada together. And there is an opportunity, of course, working together if we are successful in an energy transition, a just energy transition, in terms of solving a major global environmental crisis, which of course is climate change. But it also has the opportunity because of these investments to uh, deal with local uh, energy injustice around energy security at the same time. And additionally, it, there's an opportunity to build wealth in indigenous communities that's sustainable. So sustainable energy by definition is sustainable. So in terms of, as opposed to some of the engagement by indigenous communities in the resource sector, which can be boom and bust. The electricity sector tends to be very stable. You can be predictable uh, income flows and so on. But even if we're thinking about uh, what was talked about earlier, biomass, there's some great opportunities uh, there. So that's the opportunity uh, for economic reconciliation in Canada. But what are the pathways? This is actually on the ice road we were on uh, earlier this March before COVID shut everything down when we we're up in the 
on the way to uh, Tsikachik uh, from Anuvik uh, uh, this winter. Uh, well, there's three basic ones. The first is utility scale with little or no indigenous engagement. And I, I think of about, again, the transition, we're thinking about transmission lines, we're thinking about mining, as our colleague Manuel just pointed out, has huge impacts on indigenous communities. But so do hydro projects. And in Canada, I doubt we're gonna have major mega projects into the future. There's one of the last one that's quite controversial in British Columbia, Site C Dam on the Peace River. There are numerous uh, indigenous uh, uh, peoples who, in that area who have been in opposition. There are some who see job and opportunities as well uh, to have that balanced perspective of what's going on. But there is quite significant opposition because of the flooding on uh, traditional lands, of course. And this is echoes the point that just because it's a green energy transition doesn't mean it's a just energy transition. And this is something we need to keep in mind. But there are, there can also be utility scale uh, transitions uh, that do involve high indigenous engagement. And uh, two examples of these, uh, one is the uh, Wate uh, transmission line in Northern Ontario, which is about a $1.6 billion project, which will be indigenous owned. It's a transmission line that's owned by uh, a consortium of First Nations uh, communities in, in uh, Northern Ontario, which go is going to bring remote communities and tie them together. And it was staggering the amount, they figure over the next uh, 40 years, it'll save about $1 billion worth of diesel costs, which is hugely significant. And there's also non-Indigenous communities uh, that are also on a weak tie uh, that I referred to before will now be on a more robust uh, transmission line. So here you have literally building economic reconciliation by putting steel in the ground, which is owned and directed and controlled by First Nations peoples in Canada. And that that those kind of things are becoming more common and it appears to be the wave of the future, but you cannot uh, assume that that will continue. The other one uh, I note is First Nations Power Authority. So Saskatchewan is, uh, as our, our colleague this morning from the University of Toronto uh, pointed out, Heather, that uh, that, that uh, we have uh, a lot of coal and we've traditionally burned a lot of coal in Saskatchewan. And of course, we're gonna phase out coal as an energy source in Saskatchewan and bring on more renewables. And it was an earlier question, why don't we have more wind? Well, we actually, Saskatchewan and Alberta have by far in the way, the best wind resource and the best solar resource in all of Canada. And that is starting to come on more and you'll see uh, that's Chief uh, uh, Cadmus uh, in the foreground there in front of a solar panel and a wind turbine. They started off with a one megawatt wind, uh, one megawatt uh, solar array. And then they, with First Nations Power Authority, which was created, again, we talk about reconciliation with the Federation at that time, it was called the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations. It's now called the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations of, of Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan government to create a new agency, a nonprofit organization called First Nations Power Authority, which was to help facilitate and create uh, uh, opportunities for building renewable energy projects on a utility scale, albeit smaller, we're talking about 10 or 20 megawatt projects, but there is those mechanisms that are starting to happen in Saskatchewan to build economic reconciliation in which indigenous peoples are at the table as drivers uh, and owners of energy projects. Then we also have, that's the two utility scale, kind of the good route and, and the not so good route and the latter one of course is the better route. And uh, then we also have community in scale indigenous and a biomass. So that's a wood chipper up top underneath um, is uh, at Fort Ware in Northern British Columbia it's a combined heat and power of a uh, biomass of a remote community. And those kind of uh, community, not just utility, but meeting energy security needs, because by definition, almost, local energy is almost always renewable energy, but it creates that security in terms of supply chains for energy production. 
And so there's, that is also a growing area. It's smaller, but growing. It's, we're not on the scale of Scandinavia, but we're moving in towards that direction. So what is the value proposition of indigenous-led energy projects? And here we can have a number of them. Obviously, we can address the issues around uh, energy security in terms of reliability, access, lowering the cost of energy to some of the poorest communities in Canada. But it also has other tremendous opportunities. You will see in the top left-hand corner here, that's uh, Chief uh, Peter Beatty, and he's uh, showing us the ice plant. So this is the ice for the fish. So they have a fish plant. So it, it's a freshwater fishery. Well, you need energy to produce ice. If you had biomass like a uh, combined heat and power and on hub seasons, that you do most of the commercial fishery in the summer, not the winter, and you don't need heat in the winter, you could use waste heat to produce ice. Energy is energy, and you can produce ice and other uh, economic benefits, which can lower production costs in that community and make their fish exports uh, more uh, economically viable. Forestry is another complementary uh, industry. We have a, actually a robust, uh, as far as Canada, it's Canada in general, the forestry sector, like many sectors, is challenged. But First Nations are actively involved. In fact, in Canada, First Nations people make up 5% of the labor force in forestry. In Saskatchewan, they make up 30%, six times higher than the national average, because they own the timber licenses and the commercial uh, forestry operations. However, if you can cut down a tree and use the tops for biomass and the bottoms for dimensional lumber for construction and so on, it makes both of them more economically viable and also creates more wealth and jobs in the community. And that's part of the value proposition. And the last one is in food security. And we've seen great examples in places that this is coming in Canada more, happening in Alaska, uh, they've been leading the way using biomass, both heat and power you can use, obviously, uh, for growing food. And some of our communities, because they're poor, rely on poor quality food. And it, if you're able to have your own energy source, it makes it easier to grow food, number of food crops locally that are healthier, that will uh, uh, obviously result in better health outcomes. So we've got to get past, in terms of our conversations, past the price per kilowatt hour and looking at the full economic uh, chain and the full value proposition of social and economic benefits that Indigenous-led projects actually have, and they pencil out very well when we do. Um, oh, that's when I was at COP22 in Marrakesh. Uh, that uh, little girl there holding that uh, from... COP22 Marrakesh, that's my granddaughter who lives in uh, uh, northern Sweden, where they do a lot of biomass, uh, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm proselytizing early, uh, so I, I'm trying to convert as many as early as I can. <laughs> so it's, uh, and then uh, what's the role of universities? And, and our good colleagues at the University of Toronto, the University of Alberta, are doing absolutely world-class work and research in these fields, as you already got a hint. And, and I applaud and commend the, the pioneering, uh, pioneering efforts that they are doing uh, in our energy sector and so on. And by way of uh, contribution, uh, we're too at the University of Saskatchewan, notwithstanding COVID, are working with our, well, 17 communities from Alaska, Norway, Sweden, and uh, across Canada, indigenous communities, uh, around energy security issues and the very topics we're talking about. But I think we have a special role as universities, uh, not only on the research part, but you'll see that brochure there on the energy security, but also engaged on the ground in capacity building. And we have a distance education program uh, that students could take anywhere from around the world, quite frankly, and but it's built around working professionals who have families that live in remote communities, they could be as remote as Chiloé or Anubic uh, and take the program. But, but I think we have a moral obligation as universities to harness our full capacity, to make transitions meaningful and appropriate along the way that my good colleague Manuel uh, suggested. 
Uh, and if we do act, we will all win. Thank you very much, Greg, for this encouraging presentation to follow. What well, is the last presentation? I have, we have any questions? And I tried to make a question, a cross questions between a different presentation from the north and this hmm. ice land and uh, in the middle of the desert and lichen type culture. Uh, we can recognize some. Uh, perspective, different perspective. No, well, what is the common and uncommon approaches? And uh, the Greg is, speak about that we have to follow and another in, in, in a way that the indigenous community can uh, make their own uh, energy. No, the energy and yeah. development in this. My question is for Manuel. What do you think about and um, and and your uh, thinking? about the ontologies that inside the First Nation community energy the, that uh, Greg proposed in, in the North. And Greg, what do you think about the, what is the mean of uncommons between this community that are so supported and, and, and oh. then entrepreneurs with yep. them, maybe some uncommon with another kind of community that are outside this um this uh, um, projects and yeah. uh, the opportunities in another way only to think about and oh. and, and, and the challenges yeah. and which kind of thing as are complementary and another are not necessarily uh, complementary thanks uh, Gloria if you could if you could repeat the question I, yes I yes um I I recognize two forms to uh, to think about in, in these communities and the energy yeah. and you Manuel challenge us and in, in the and to think about and what is the uncommons and uh, another uh, is the, the the way to think about in the energy transitions with another beings no my kindships and so on yeah. and what is the common and uncommon yeah. in this way yeah. to think about why to make this transition. Yeah. And uh, Greg proposed an, another uh, form to think about and to engage uh, and to think about in the reconciliation and which is where or, or whom start the concept of recognition. Uh, this is maybe a complementary form to think about in your uncommon uh, perspective. And, and another way, Greg, uh, maybe I think to think about more in a, in a different way that the, this uncommons is inside a different or within different uh, indigenous communities when different access for energies and so on. Yeah. Okay, I, uh, I get it now. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you, Greg, for such a, an interesting uh, presentation. It's really great to see how uh, you are dealing with very similar questions in Canada and, and the great work uh, you are doing, trying to, trying, to, trying to kind of to make possible uh, dialogues that, sometime, that mm. sometimes are quite difficult to, to implement. Um, I, I think it's important, first of all, to say that indigenous communities are diverse. They are not kind of like isolated communities, uh, uh, hermetic communities. Uh, within them, there is a diversity of actors, a diversity of, uh, of uh, dispositions, a diversity yeah. Of, um, yeah. of, of assumptions and projects and ideas, right? Uh, so I think that's, that's the beauty, or that's, um, I, I will say that's, that's something that sometimes we, uh, kind of forget, right? That indigenous communities are as, uh, as diverse as any other community, right? Um, and, 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 and so I think that my point, rather than essentializing uh, indigenous communities as people, as animist people, so yeah, to speak, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's not my point. I'm not trying to say that uh, for Likan anti communities, they only see uh, they only approach the salt flat as an, a grandfather. Uh, of course, that for, for, for them, the salt flat is also a source of economic development. Yeah. Uh, 
they, and, and they, they, they do want to tap on that opportunity. My point rather is to how to, how to, how to kind of articulate a, an encounter that is sensible and that is generous for all parties, especially for, communi for indigenous communities that has, have been relegated and marginalized and, 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 and oppressed in many different ways. Mm. And so my argument is that um, it doesn't matter what kind of project has, uh, it doesn't matter the, the content of, of, of the project, of the proposal, you know, uh, what is important is, is the procedure. And the procedure has to be based on, um, on, the, uh, on, on granting, on, 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 on a restitu restituting uh, self-determination and sovereignty, mm. some kind of sovereignty. Because mm. uh, it's, also, it's also misleading to think that indi all indigenous communities want full sovereignty, that they want right. to be like another nation with another passport. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's the case for some communities, but it's not the case yeah. for all communities. It's way more complex than that. But we have to find a way of granting, of, of, of allowing uh, indigenous communities to kind of uh, re, re empower. I mean, like, 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 uh, um, like um, uh, to, to retake what was theirs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the right to decide in their territories. And we have to find that way. I don't know which, I, I don't know how. It, maybe it's plurinationality, maybe it's another kind of legal mechanism, uh, but that's my point, rather than kind of essentializing or romanticizing indigenous communities exactly. as, you know, like people that are seeing uh, animated beings everywhere. Yeah. No, no, I just want to jump in, Manuel. I, I mean, uh, I need to bring you to Canada because this, uh, your perspective is so, uh, I, I fully agree actually with your perspective. In, and here's one of the interesting things. Um, I, I, a couple of things. People think sometimes if Indigenous peoples get more rights, then all of a sudden resource development or energy development and so on will come to a halt because indigenous communities will veto everything. That is simply not true. And you can see so many cases, in fact, in Canada, even with the mining sector, when you have very powerfully uh, with self-government land claims agreements, actually because you've leveled the playing field more, can actually engage in a more meaningful, uh, respectful um, agreements that create those winning instead of just bulldozing through people. And, uh, and sometimes the answer is no. And, and, it's, and many times it's gonna be yes, but the idea that indigenous peoples having rights is gonna slow down or stop resource development simply is not true. And, and, and you're, I, make, I think you make a, a, a extremely important point about the diversity, not only across communities, but even within communities themselves, because sometimes people forget in, uh, to your point, uh, it's gonna surprise some people that indigenous peoples are people. And so should it surprise us that communities will have diverse views among communities and within them. Um, but here's the thing about uh, the uncommonality in, and I don't think, I think 95% of Canadians don't understand this point, maybe 99%. When it comes to renewable energy indigenous communities, to your point about romanticizing, many people, including politicians in Ottawa, believe that uh, indigenous peoples will support renewable energy because of the romantic uh, indigenous person who wants to be steward of the planet and keep things pristine. You go into a northern community and the discussions around renewable energy, you never even end up talking about climate change. Their issues are far more fundamental. They're interested in renewable energy because it provides local energy security. When it's 30 below, they know that they can still heat their homes, that they can they don't have the eat or heat dilemma. Do I feed my family or heat my home? Uh, and these kind of core questions. But to your point, that requires a dialogue. To your point, that requires not making assumptions about other people's values. And where you and for many, they do see also things like uh, biomass, for example, the ability to to take care of the land in a, a sustainable way. 
but uh, no, I, I, I thought your perspective, frankly, I felt like I was cheating because you were almost setting up the theoretical or the philosophical basis uh, for what I was uh, hoping to engage. So I was uh, very grateful for your perspective. Well, thank you very much. Maybe the, this is one of the questions that Carla uh, asked from Indigenous community, what aspects are important on, or, or where important for the success of energy project in Canada? Maybe you answer more or less uh, it, <laughs> it and... Uh... Yeah, are important for the success. Energy sovereignty, you're starting to hear the term energy sovereignty. And, and I'm borrowing uh, from Manuel again about uh, the notion of sovereignty. So it's becoming more common uh, in the parlance or the discussions is uh, energy sovereignty, that mm -hmm. uh, indigenous peoples have control over energy production for their communities. That's easily number one. Uh, and then, then the benefits that come to the community from that, um, whether it's health, whether it's food, whether it's jobs, whether it's an income stream, and, and, the, and of course, doing things in an environmentally sustainable way, which, is not unique, of course, to Indigenous peoples, but obviously very important to many. Mm. So those are the common measures that we're hearing uh, in Indigenous communities. Thank you, Greg. Thank Rodia? you, Manuel. Yes, yes, yeah. No, I just uh, wanted to say, just as Greg uh, beautifully recognized when he began uh, the land on which his university is uh, located, I also wanted to say that uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to talk. I think that an indigenous spoke person should be here instead of me. Right? And, and I feel a little bit embarrassed to talk in the name of uh, Lincoln anti communities. Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, I understand that maybe, I understand the nature of this, um, of this seminar uh, and I'm really grateful for being here. But, um, but I think that most probably uh, an indigenous uh, Likanantai uh, representative would be much better than me to talk about the, the, the possibilities and the challenges of energy transitions in their territory. Thank you so much for the organization. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Well, thank you for all. <laughs> Jack, it's your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Thank you, Greg. We will take into account your, your recommendation Manuel, for the next event. Um, I would like to, on behalf of the National Agency for Research and Development, ANID, uh, I would like to thank everyone, special, especially our panelists and our moderator, Gloria, uh, for your valuable yeah. uh, time. Uh, I, in my personal view, I think there was only brilliant presentation, so it was Really great, really great to me. And of course, to thank all the attendees that have been uh, with us with us today. So uh, just thank you in, in the name of Anit Rodrigo. Well, uh, thank you so much again to everyone. Thank you to every one of our panelists this morning. I have learned a lot, I have to say. So I am very pleased to, to be here and I much appreciate Gloria, your time and uh, leading the conversation this morning. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Anit, Jack and all the team at Anit for organizing this event. Yeah. For sure, we will do more events in the future. That's the idea, covering different topics. So thank you again, Greg, Manuel, Gloria, Sanjit, Heather, and Hector that uh, they left already, but uh, we are very pleased this morning with all the information that we have received through you. Thank you to the people attending, and we wish you all a wonderful Christmas time that is coming soon. So uh, at this point uh, here in Canada, with the snow in Santiago, Chile, with a uh, very nice temperature. Yeah. It is going to be a little different, but thank you again for all your participation. So see you next time. Absolutely. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much and see you soon.
Muchas gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego. Gracias.